chapter three, Two Mirrors, a Poetic Interlude. In the previous chapters, we explored the historical context of James and the Jerusalem church, highlighting their incomplete understanding of justification and Gentile inclusion. This background sets the stage for one of the most significant challenges in interpreting James, the contradiction between his teachings on faith and works and those of the Apostle Paul. As we delve into this issue, it's crucial to recognize that James reflects a Paul a pre-Pauline understanding of the gospel and attempts to reconcile his words with Paul's through various g- mental gymnastics lead to a distortion of the doctrine of justification by faith alone. However, I do not teach that James does not evidence inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's my view that the Holy Spirit did engineer this epistle to illustrate some points that are a contrast to the doctrine of Christ in a way that James could not have been aware at the time when he wrote. I wonder if you've ever noticed, like I have, that there are two major sections in the New Testament where the word is likened to a mirror. James likens the word to a mirror, and Paul likens the word to a mirror. One is in James chapter 1, the other is in 2 Corinthians 3. James 1's mirror, (laughs) uh, for if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass, for he beholds himself and goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he not being a forgetful doer, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. And then 2 Corinthians 3 We all, with unveiled face, beholding, as in a glass, the glory of the Lord, are being changed into the same, or transformed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Lord uh, Spirit, or the Spirit of the Lord. Sorry, I've memorized a couple different versions of that. Um, Now, if you look closely at these mirrors, you will find that they reflect different images. There are different conclusions about whose image you should be, or are, looking at in the mirror. Paul's mirror, beholding the and reflecting Christ's glory. We'll look at Paul's mirror first because his doctrine is the lens through which we should interpret the whole Bible, being the speaking of the ascended Christ from heaven, containing many new truths that were previously a hidden mystery in God, which shine light on everything that went before and illuminate what was previously shrouded in shadow. Paul discusses a fundamental term from the Law of Moses that was engraved in stone, which he calls a ministration of condemnation and death. He explains that the law acts as a veil, so that to this day, when Jews read the scripture through the lens of Moses, they are veiled. This veil is represented by the one Moses wore over his face when he came down from the mount, signifying that the fading glory that accompanied what Paul called the ministry of condemnation and death, represented by the tablets engraved on stone. Paul tells us that glory was fading, and the writing on stone is waxing old and fading away. It's temporal, not eternal. In contrast to those veiled when looking through the lens of Moses, Paul declares that we all, with unveiled face, are beholding and reflecting, as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord which is shining in the face of Jesus Christ. While the glory that shone in Moses' face was a fading glory covered with a veil, The glory that shines in the face of Jesus Christ is an open, remaining, and permanent weight of glory that is wrought into us as we believe. Paul compares his ministry to that of Moses, describing the latter as the ministry of the letter which kills, and the former as the ministry of the Spirit which gives life. The New Testament ministry, which reveals Christ, directly is the ministry of righteousness. It imparts the life of Christ. He goes on to say that he and the other apostles minister according to this new uh, administration of righteousness, and God is writing not on tablets of stone, but on fleshly tablets of the hearts of believers, and he declares, you are an epistle of Christ, known and read by all men. Paul's mirror, the transformative power of the gospel. Paul discusses how, when he speaks the gospel of Christ, that word opens the glory of Christ, and the Spirit reveals the glory of Christ. The glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ illuminates the hearts of the hearers who are unveiled, allowing them to turn to the Lord, behold him, be saved, and even transformed. He asserts that this process writes something permanent, a weight of glory, into their hearts that never fades. As a result, they become living, eternal epistles of Christ, in contrast to the tablets of stone, which, although glorious, could be destroyed, dissolved, lost, or faded, and cannot compare to the exceeding weight of eternal glory represented by the New Testament ministry of Christ. In Paul's mirror, we 
are to behold and reflect Christ, reflect the face of Jesus Christ, uh, and are transformed into that same image from glory to glory. The glory shining in his face is now engraved in our hearts, leaving his impression like a shining set of letters, a glorious eternal writing that will be seen forever. As believers in Christ, we become the expression of the word of God when we receive the word that is spirit and life. It is our profound concept. It is a profound concept to consider that the finger of God is writing on our hearts as we embrace the gospel and grow in the knowledge of Christ. James Mirror, exposing our fallen condition. In contrast, James speaks of a mirror, and his focus is not on Christ, Christ is not mentioned, but on the one looking in the mirror. He states that if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who beholds his natural face in the mirror. When he walks away from it, he forgets what kind of man he was. In James's analogy, the person coming to the word is not beholding Christ, but rather his own natural man, which Paul said cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God and is crucified with Christ. James suggests that if you come to the word, hear it, but do not act on it, you cannot expect to be blessed. However, he says that if you're looking in the mirror and beholding yourself, uh, he says that you are looking in the mirror beholding yourself. From Paul's ministry, which later revealed the true function of the law, the mirror, the law, should have exposed you, revealing blemishes and spots, because the law magnifies those things. The law is a mirror that shows you yourself and your fallen condition. The conclusion we must reach to establish the law is to see that we were crucified with Christ and have died with it, uh, died with him, or died to the law. We learn this from Paul in Romans 7, 1 through 4, and Galatians 1, 19 through 21. This is a mystery truth, a truth that was not known until it was revealed to Paul. The apostles in Jerusalem did not know they had been crucified with Christ, had died to the law in the death of Christ, and that Christ was now their life, and that the Christian life is not I, but Christ. This is Paul's uniquely to declare, and if anyone tells you otherwise, they're in unbelief about Paul's own statements regarding his ministry. James, written years prior to the Acts 15 conference, could not have known this or expressed such a thing doctrinally. 2 Corinthians would be written many years later, but the Holy Spirit organized for these mirrors to be set up as a contrast and even gave the hints and seed of his doctrine in James' writing. This uh, example... This is an example of inspiration that shows the design of God in the scripture that transcends the human author's immediate intentions. On the surface, James is teaching that it is the doer of the word that is blessed in his deed, and he will eventually connect that to faith without works is dead in James 2. But the seed of the truth is all there. If you take James' admonition at face value, looking at something to do in order to be blessed, you are walking in the principle of the law. A legalist, looking at the word and the principle of the law, is the veiled person that Paul refers to in 1 Corinthians, whose mind is blinded. Thinking that you're finding some instruction for you to do in order to be blessed and not carrying it out should bring you to a crisis, such as that referred to in Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? If you... If your lack of doing does not bring you to any kind of crisis, it's because you've forgotten what you saw in the mirror, the kind of man the law has revealed you to be. James concludes this section by stating that if you break the law in one point, you have broken the whole thing, a sentiment echoed by Paul. It's interesting that James presents us with admonitions that he does not give us any hope of keeping. He tells that breaking us the law at one point means we've broken the whole thing, and he lets us know that this is not speaking of the ceremonial law, such as feasts and circumcision, but the moral law. If you fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. But if you have respect to persons, you commit sin and are convicted of the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law yet offend in one point, he's guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if you commit no adultery, yet you kill, you are become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do, as though that shall be judged by the law of liberty, for he shall have judgment without mercy, that have showed mercy, uh, showed no mercy, and mercy rejoices against judgment. However, the emphasis in the presentation of the mirrors differs, because James has you looking at yourself with the glory of Christ veiled and the law present. The law should be doing its work, which, as Paul revealed, is a ministry of condemnation and death to expose your sinful nature and show you what you are. 
The law's purpose is not for self-improvement, but to reveal your spots and blemishes, leading you to seek the solution. Uh, the person who remains in the law, continuing to hear it without doing it, and not allowing it to become a crisis, is someone who has forgotten what the law shows them to be. When they look in that mirror and walk away from it, they're forgetful, which is not good. They have not judged the flesh. They certainly have not come to the conclusion, I am crucified with Christ. This is not a conclusion that a believer can reach apart from the mystery revealed by Paul. James does not go on to say that if you're not a forgetful doer, I'm sorry, James does go on to say that if you're not a forgetful doer, but a hearer, a forgetful hearer, but a doer, sorry, you'll be blessed in your deed or your work. This principle echoes Deuteronomy 28, where Moses uh, declares, behold, I've set before you life and death, choose life that you may live. It's in the principle of the law. If you do it, you'll be blessed in the city, blessed in the field, blessed going in and blessed coming out. You'll be the head and not the tail, above only not beneath. However, Moses also warns us that if you disobey the law, you'll be cursed going in and going out. You'll be the tail underneath and not above, and all the curses in the book will come upon you. Paul states that as many as of the work of the law are under the curse, because cursed is the one that does not continue in all the things of the law to do it. As James said, if you keep the law but break it in one point, you're guilty of breaking the whole thing. The reality is that we both we have broken the law at many points again and again. I like to say that those who boast in being commandment keepers should call themselves commandment breakers because that's the reality of the situation. Pastors often say, all you have to do is love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. They suggest it's not that hard, and you just don't want to do it. However, when the commandment says all, it means the entirety of your being, the entirety of your existence from start to finish, with no interruption and no breaking. Otherwise, it's not all. The only person who ever embodied this was Jesus Christ, who lived entirely for the glory of God and not for himself. That's what's required, and that's not easy. It's not that we don't want to do it. We recognize that there's something in us that corresponds with the law, and we want to do it. But if we come to the law looking for something to do and walk away from it, we are not allowing that mirror to show us who we really are. Flipping the mirror, unveiled to behold the Lord. Eventually, you're going to have to flip the mirror. If you're a legalist looking for something to do, it's currently showing you your natural man. But you'll eventually realize that you cannot be blessed this way. You're only cursed. That's when you have a turn, which is what Paul is talking about. He says that when one turns to the Lord and is unveiled, they're no longer looking at themselves or the law, trying to determine what to do. Instead, they're beholding Christ and what he accomplished, seeing the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ. This is how we learn to approach the Bible. Our devotional time is not so that we can hear from the Lord about what we should do, but so that we can forget ourselves and let God describe to us the inheritance we have in Christ. Reading through James, there's a mixture of law and grace with no clear distinctions and no doctrine of Christ. There are hints of the doctrine of Christ, but there are hints of the law. James gives us admonitions we cannot keep and tells us we cannot keep them. If we break the law in one point, we've broken it all. He says we must tame our tongue, but then says no man can tame it. There's a rudimentary realization that man is not capable, but there's an expectation that he should try. In contrast to the natural face of the man who is not a doer of the word, there's the law of liberty, another option to behold in the mirror. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholds himself, goes his way, and straightway forgets what manner of man he was. But whoever looks in the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he, is, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. If any man among you seems to be religious and bridles not his tongue, he deceives his own heart, and his religion is in vain. Some have tried to suggest that the law of liberty that James is referring to is the law of Christ. Uh, that, uh, that, 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 the, I'm sorry. Some have tried to suggest that the law of liberty is Christ that Paul is speaking of. Indeed, James also mentions receiving the engrafted word with meekness, which is able to save your soul. The forgetful hearer, apparently, is a man who walks away from the mirror only beholding his natural face. But the blessed doer is the one who continues at the, uh, to look at the perfect law of liberty and receive the engrafted word. This is all beautiful speaking in James chapter 1 that can be relatively neutral and even allegorically interpreted as Christ being the word. However, the problem is not with James 1. James 1 has some of the highest grace sentiments in the Bible, such as the discipline that comes from 
uh, as wisdom from the Father of lights, in whom there's no variance or shifting shadow, from whom all perfect and good gifts come, who gives wisdom liberally and without rebuke. James knows grace, but he does not know the doctrine of Christ as it would be revealed in Paul. In James 2, as we'll see in future chapters, you cannot get around his plain statements regarding justification without allegorizing what he says, as many in the free grace camp do, simply denying what he's saying and what his words plainly state. Furthermore, the law of liberty from chapter 1 becomes the royal law in chapter 2. While some want to say that this is the law of the spirit of life, they'll also correlate it with the teachings of Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, assuming that these are New Testament commandments. This is why they are saying they're not teaching law. They will distinguish the Sermon on the Mount from Moses, saying it's not law, but the commandments of Christ. But then, they will equate it with the royal law referred to by James. This is erroneous in two ways. One, James associates the royal law with the commandments of Moses. He says that the royal law specifically is to love your neighbor as yourself, which Jesus said is the greatest of the commandments of Moses besides loving God with all our heart. And in both cases, the Sermon on the Mount and the Royal Law, this is not so, uh, and, and the Law of Moses, uh, this is not something the flesh is capable of doing, and neither of them is New Testament. It is not the New Commandment, which is to believe in Jesus Christ and to love one another, not with our love, but with a love that comes from God. 1 John 3.23 um, The second error is that the Sermon on the Mount is not a set of commandments, a new set of commandments of Christ. It is the Mosaic Law, with a particular focus on the commandment, you shall not covet, bringing the focus not to the outward actions, but to the inward desires of the heart, those lusts and covetousness and hatred that we have without even thinking about it, due to the law of sin in our members. This is the one and same royal law that James is referring to, and it is the Mosaic Law. Paul tells us clearly in 2 Corinthians by the revelation that was given to him that this law is fading away, it's a ministration of condemnation and death, and those who continue in it are veiled. What we see in James is a mixture. Uh, what we see in James, sorry, is a mixture. There is inspiration, there's genuine grace. There are exhortations to do what he admits we cannot do. His answer to the fact that we can't do them? Keep trying. Confess your sins to one another. Repent. Wash your hands, you sinners. Don't trust the flesh, don't make vows, but still endeavor in the flesh. Work at it. God will give you wisdom. He'll make a way for you. But the way is not defined. What is the way? It's Christ himself who is actually missing from the entirety. Uh, he, Christ himself who is actually missing almost entirely from James's epistle. James is a picture of the regenerated man who does not understand the mystery of Christ, has not entered into the meat of the word, and his teaching and thinking are exactly suited to what Paul called, in 1 Corinthians, the carnal man. This is not the fault of James. Paul didn't bring his teaching to Jerusalem until many years later. But that teaching was never expressed fully in Jerusalem because there was so much opposition and disputing. James is what the Christian life looks like with a risen Christ, a standing temple, the overhanging glory of Moses, though fading, and yet not a present up-to-date truth concerning what has changed, the new creation, Christ in you, and all of its detail. This two mirrors chapter serves as a poetic interlude, showcasing the inspiration of James's epistle while acknowledging the limitations of his understanding. By contrasting the mirrors presented by James and Paul, we see that the Holy Spirit had a transcendent hand in organizing James's letter in a way that surpassed his ability to interpret or understand. The inclusion of the fallacious statements in James 2 remains intact, not as a contradiction to Paul's teachings, but as a testament to the progressive revelation of the gospel and the importance of rightly dividing the word of truth. As we move forward in exploring the various attempts to harmonize James and Paul, let's keep in mind the historical context and the need to uphold the doctrine of justification by faith alone as clearly taught by the Apostle Paul.